Okay. Uh, thank you, Jason. I, I want to thank you all for sticking around for this talk. Um, this is, if I had to choose a group of people to present to, it's the people who are the diehards looking to stick around to the bitter end. Uh, and uh, I'm particularly honored tonight by the presence of someone in the crowd, uh, the chair of the board of directors of Python Software Foundation, Naomi Cedar. I chased her down after a talk she did on the micro bit uh, about a year and a half ago. I'm, I think she just figured out my name. So uh, I also would like to uh, recognize my wife and parents came to tonight's meeting. Uh, they wanted to ditch uh, after the first talk, but I said they had to stick around. And finally, some of my teammates are here tonight. So thank you all for sticking around. Thank you for being here. I'm going to be brief. I want this to be kind of a high energy talk, and I want you all to get a lot out of it. Uh, so let's get going. Um, First note, for you to get the most out of this talk, what you're looking at doesn't really matter. It's just there for some extra context or if you're looking to stop listening to me. I'm not saying anything that isn't already on these slides. In fact, I'm providing more context, so don't really worry about what's going on behind me. But for this first part, we're going to be recognizing uh, the benefits of better services using gRPC and protocol buffers. If you find yourself lost at any point during this talk, just bring yourself back to one idea, and this is about how, commuter, how computers communicate. So I'm, in, I'm coming from a distant futuristic world uh, where my team and I craft excellent microservice-based architecture. I'm a data platform and uh, a data engineer at Bank of America. I work as part of a team uh, where that's our co core focus and competency. Uh, we develop uh, kind of general purpose microservices for clients to come and use and do their job really well. We're going to focus on kind of why and how of gRPC and protocol buffers. I'm going to show you guys a demo, and we're going to wrap up. Pretty simple. Just a little bit of housekeeping, some required vocabulary for you to get the most out of this. What is an RPC? An RPC is a remote procedure call. Uh, think of it this way. A program requests a service living in a separate computer without having to know anything about the networking details or anything. It could call your local client could call a service living in a remote machine as if that call is local. This is a powerful mechanism. How is that facilitated? We have something called a stub. And a, suffice it to say, a stub is kind of like a native client library. Your, your client employs uh, the stub. It deputizes the call to uh, the remote instance. And it's like it's, it's local. It allows your client and server to communicate very transparently. If you're lost about any of that, RPCs are a mechanism by which computers communicate. Let's talk about microservices for a minute, just kind of building the case for gRPC and protocol buffers. Microservices are a very powerful architectural paradigm. Uh, it focuses on independent service evolution. So instead of having a a uh, very large monolithic application. We never build any of those at Bank of America. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you could evolve smaller services independent of one another. So say I just I want to uh, use a uh, get time series service. That is a service that I call. I made some examples for get time series service today at work. Um, that service could be managed independent of my uh, get key value store service. They don't have to be mashed into the same uh, umbrella of services that need to talk to each other. They could handle themselves just fine on their own. Very powerful way to think about orchestrating services. These serv uh, as a result, your services could be very narrow in scope, very focused. And you could build them as it serves a business need or uh, our developer need. 
they're optimized for change. They're optimized for reuse and in a generic context. So anyone could come along and federate uh, the get time series service or get user service or uh, create user service. They're generic. Let's come back to, uh, to what this talk is really about, which is communication. Why we really need great communication. There's a number of reasons why, but the most important is we want great services. We want our services to be very robust, uh, fault tolerant. We want them to uh, ideally have, uh, be very low latency. The result of, those, uh, of that is very happy customers, and as importantly, if not more importantly, a high developer quality of life. So let's talk about how we're going to achieve this. Um, we're going to have a, a simple, high-performance communication protocol. Ideally, we, we should have machine-readable API contracts. So when I pass something to a remote instance, it knows everything that I'm talking about. There's no guessing, lack of ambiguity. We'd like to support multiple languages. Um, I, uh, I had thought to talk about Airflow. I'm not, I'm not, um, Airflow, I'm not sure that there are more uh, client APIs besides just Python. I might be wrong, but think about all of the services that you use that are uh, language centric. It's a barrier that you don't have to impose on users who want to come use your service. And most importantly, this thing that we're doing, uh, how we're going to build great communication, this thing should be easy to use. So what are we going to do? I'm sure you all uh, are suspecting what, what's going to happen. And we're just going to use REST. <laughs> right? Because REST is great. We use REST for everything. And that's my talk. <laughs> Progress bar is halfway. Progress bar is we're not going to use REST, actually, we're, for a number of reasons why. Uh, REST is probably simple enough for simple uh, HTTP services, uh, where I could get by with using a get, post, put, delete uh, type of, uh, of semantic, where those are pretty well understood. If you think about uh, like a bank transfer scenario, a more complex service, where I'm issuing uh, REST commands to uh, maybe, uh, I'm, so now I'm talking about a user, okay, and now I'm talking about an amount, and I'm talking about this account, and also this account should be transferred uh, to the separate account after a certain number of days, uh, and maybe it should funnel in these amounts. It's a, it's a pretty, uh, something that probably happens often, but it's pretty complex when you're talking about it in scope of REST. We're in this context, we can't keep, the client can't keep narrow concerns. It says, ooh, I have all of these things that I need to worry about, all of these, all of this business going on. It can't focus and be really good at one thing, which is what all computer programs should strive towards. And just to hammer this on home a bit further, it's one of my favorite movies. Uh, Writing client APIs, from a more personal perspective, writing client, writing client APIs requires people who are expensive and are very grumpy about having to write client APIs, especially when you're talking about multiple languages. So I have some sort of generic thing, and now I have to um, manage a Java client, a C++ client, a Go client, et cetera. There's streaming issues with REST. It's, it's not simple and bi-directional streaming is impossible where you send a batch of requests to the server and before, your, uh, before all of your requests even make it and are being processed, you're receiving responses from the server, bi-directional stream. Impossible with REST on top of HTTP 1.1. When we're talking about REST in practice, it usually just means HTTP endpoints. I'm probably not the only one here using a RESTful framework where uh, I don't actually have uh, composed uh, uniform resource locators that follow a, a, 
a certain orientation. When I stand up a REST service, usually it just means that I'm talking to some sort of server and I'm passing JSON. They're not actually RESTful. Uh, and finally, very importantly, we don't have formal machine readable API contracts. Let's get back to the meat of the issue. We want something in order to achieve great communication and great services, which makes our lives better, which allows our, our business clients to sing our praises, uh, which makes everyone happy. We need something that's simple and performant, a great communication protocol, machine readable API contracts so my remote server knows exactly what I'm talking about when I say uh, transfer amount equals 150 euro or something like that. Multiple language support, it's imperative. Don't put up that barrier when you don't have to. It should be easy to use. And gRPC is what will actually make all of this work. gRPC stands for Google Remote Procedure Call. It's an open source, universal, high performance RPC framework. It's, if you go to the gRPC docs, that's what they'll tell you, but I can confirm. Started and maintained by Google. Uh, it was open sourced, uh, it started out as Stubby, which was an internal uh, engine for issuing RPCs. It's pretty simple how it works. We have something called a service definition which describes our API. It describes um, kind of the methods and messages that we're going to pass into our service that might be something like a, in the bank transfer scenario, um, transfer, uh, like transfer, transfer cash is probably um, a name of a, a method we might call and it will take a user message, a uh, an amount message, for example. And this is where we define uh, this. From that simple service definition, we could generate uh, our client and server code in more than 10 languages, and that includes Python. Uh, when we are talking about our messages uh, in the context of gRPC, where we have to first serialize them into something called protocol buffers. We'll get more into that. Our clients connect and call our services, and we're able to say, okay, uh, some sort of client somewhere needs to use the bank transfer service. They'll just go and use the client. They don't need to have any other concerns besides here's user, here's an amount, call the service. Uh, this is probably the, the best way to describe it in terms of a, of a, of a visual. On the left side, we have a high-performance C++ gRPC server. We only need to have one server that's responding to gRPC requests. We could have something like a Ruby client issue a proto request, and the server responds with a proto response. And uh, in parallel, we might have uh, like a Python client or a Java client, uh, a Go client, or a separate C++ client come and talk to the server, issuing protocol buffer messages, getting those back, so let's dive into what protocol buffers actually are, their important component. They're both a message format and an interface definition language. So when we describe our, uh, it, it's, um, when we describe our messages, we're, we're talking those serialized messages, those are protocol buffers, what is traveling along the wire, protocol buffers. It's what we serialize and it's what we need to deserialize from the server. They're small, fast, and unambiguous because they're strongly typed. Um, we get by with having dynamic typing. It's kind of nice, also somewhat not nice in Python. You see more and more emphasis on strong typing in Python. Take a look at, a look at data classes. Um, they're language neutral and platform neutral. They're a very agnostic mechanism towards serializing structured data. It doesn't really care much else about having types and uh, giving you something that will travel in a performant way over the wire. You describe it once and you're able to serialize your structured data. You have structure in a service. You know what's going to be coming into an, uh, a server. You know what, to, what the server is going to respond back with. So you could write it once and generate your source code. It's used uh, within the context of HTTP2 um, clients may open a connection to a gRPC server just to talk a little bit more about HTTP2. It's, um, you're able of over across a single TCP connection, multiplex your streams. And these streams uh, represent 
uh, a, in this context, RPC calls. So over a single connection, you could have many bidirectional RPCs going at once, which is something that is totally impossible with HTTP 1.1. And this is to just hammer the differences home a little bit more. Um, the one thing I haven't mentioned yet, protocol buffers are a binary protocol. Uh, whereas when we're talking about REST, JSON, text protocol. Bidirectional streaming, much higher performance. Both the client and server have a context of what my API actually means. Using gRPC, we could create those client libraries, which if you're using REST, you're stuck building each uh, client uh, lang uh, library for languages. And when your API changes, APIs change, you're needing then to double back and maybe change it. And some of those changes might be kind of messy. You could just generate the code using gRPC. OK, protocol buffers versus other forms of marshalling or serialization. Pickle is fine, um, but not really. Uh, it's Python specific, and you can't evolve the schema. You, you've already created something that's fixed. Um, you have encoding and decoding runtime costs um, when we're talking about text or strings or JSON. There, it's also a heavier protocol. In XML, we should just forget it. Uh, it's complicated, inefficient, very heavy, notoriously heavy in space uh, with space requirements and you can't read it at all. We should forget it. Um, so we're, we're answering some important questions for ourselves. How do we expose a service on a remote machine? Okay, we have this concept of RPCs, so we stand up a server, execute calls back and forth, okay. Um, we're, we know how to serialize and deserialize over the wire because we have this machine readable API contract. When a server responds, Based upon our request, we know exactly what we're getting back. We know that if it's a, if it's a unary RPC, in, uh, in other words, one, um, you could go unary client uh, server stream or unary unary. Unary is one request. Um, so if I, have a, um, if I have a streaming client, I'm sending multiple requests at once to the server, I might have a unary RPC server, and I'm going to get one response back. Of course, I could just do bidirectional too for very high performance concerns. I could also authenticate uh, within gRPC, which is, uh, I have multiple options there. So what do we think about these sorts of things? Talk is cheap, show me the code, right? So what I'm showing you now is a protocol buffer definition. And I think this should probably be big enough. Um, you see the syntax is a little unusual, but we could follow it pretty easily. Um, I have a service called a profile service. I wanted to make something that could be useful in the context of the Chippy Mentorship Program. Um, so let's say that we have uh, something called a create user profile. It makes sense, and it follows the Google Cloud API design guide, which the market data technology team that I work as part of follows that very carefully for when we're crafting services. Create user profile request makes sense, and I get a create user profile response back. That is what I'm talking about when I'm executing a create user profile RPC. We see some other syntax in here, like a stream. So this would be a bidirectional stream where I'm creating user profiles. So I serialize a number of profiles. Those are moving over the wire, and I'm getting responses back, like uh, 200 OK, or um, some sort of failure message where I might have incorrect, improperly, um, maybe I have a duplicate user or the fields are improperly formatted or something odd happening. So one thing I'd like to emphasize, which may help you as you look at this foreign thing, is think about composability. We're going to focus on one of these RPCs and that's create user profile. Create user profile request. That is, so I have a service definition here, and now I need to define the create user profile request message. So scroll down, create user profile request. Great. Um, again, these are strongly typed. So I have something called a user, and I have something called a profile, and a user is the user type, a profile is the profile type. So I have this sort of abstract thing going on. I could easily get further into this. So let's take the user first. 
Great. Okay. Does this make sense? A user has a first name. A user has a last name in most cases. In the case of our service, that is true. And a user has a term. So we're associating first name, last name with a term. You could think, um, you could think Jason Worth, spring 2019. That would be the definition of a user. Spring 2019, like mentorship program or whatever. This is how we uniquely speak about a user. And a term has a season and a year. And we, again, strong typing. First name is always going to be a string. Season is always going to be a string. But the year is always going to be an in 32. This becomes important because when I speak to my server, or when I'm getting responses from my server, I know their type. I know how to intelligently communicate with them because it's giving me something based upon what I have defined here. So as we come back to create user profile requests, it's not so scary. We know that when we talk about a user, first name, last name, term, and a profile is just maybe one string. Like, uh, I love Python because of the community, uh, lots of answers on Stack Overflow, hello world program was very straightforward. That might be a, an example of a profile, simple string. So I'd like to, let's activate a virtual environment. And we're going to run a gRPC server here. And I'll get into what a gRPC server looks like in a minute. Cool, our server is running. OK, um, I'm not going to generate them, but we have our proto file here. This profile service.proto is what we were looking at before. I, whatever. Um, cool, so that's just what we had before. Now, what we could generate is some Python source code. So because it's strongly typed, we could generate our client libraries. In this case, I could generate uh, our message definitions. And so when I, uh, these are automatically generated. So it's not recommended that you go in and change these unless there's some sort of interesting reason why you have to, but these come for free. So when I have the .proto defined, I could generate my Java. I could generate my C++. I could generate my Go. Is gen it's a generic thing. And because of that strong typing, I have more flexibility later on for just the simple cost of having to stand up a dot proto and the stronger typing. So this is, this is the file that we use to serialize our messages. And this is the file. We, this is a bit more of an interesting file, which uh, helps out our stub. And so we'll get there in just a second. Uh, in fact, let's stay on this. Um, uh, what do I want? I want our server. This is an example. So this is a profile service PB2. That is our, we work with that in order to serialize our messages. The PB2 gRPC is a module that we use when uh, talking with our stub. And so it goes to, stands for reason that within our profile servicer class, we want to be talking to our stub, and we have this profile service servicer. Um, even the, even kind of the semantics of it sound like, okay, this, this thing that I'm talking about here is going to take care of uh, what my client might do. It's going to service my requests to the gRPC server. Uh, and this is, Working with gRPC in Python is truly Pythonic because I could stand up a gRPC server with some methods. Um, in fact, I could probably do this in less than 20 lines, but with uh, some server methods, I already have a server which is running over here. That's what I started before. So my server is going to be running for a day. I have it running locally, but we could have this running on a, I have, you know, a, my, I had a broken pipe in my SSH configuration. So I was going to put this on a Linode instance, but it's running locally here. And let's go ahead and try something. Uh, 
let's gain a, let's gain a little bit of context. So let's 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 try out our uh, let's try out our client. Okay, so within our client, we have a main here, and our main is going to create a profile service client. It's going to I am using Faker, so we are going to generate some names. We're going to generate a profile, names and profile, just first name, last name, a string. And we're going to use our client to create a user profile. And this is, this is pretty interesting, what's happening here. Just try to stick with me for a minute. Uh, within this service client, I, cre I, I am connecting to my server. That's where I have a channel. I'm not securing it just for, by way of a, a demonstration, but you can secure a server. Um, and I finally, I have a stub, and I use that stub. Remember, a stub is a mechanism by which our, it's, it's kind of like a, that native client library. So I'm using the stub so that the client could communicate with the remote instance. So just pretend that the server is living elsewhere. Uh, let's go back to our proto definition for a moment. Sorry about this. Yes. Okay, so the proto definition, remember this concept of composability. So we have a user, we have a term. A create profile request is composed of a user and a term. And that will be reflected within our client. So when I try to create a user profile, I use that, uh, that message, that generated message uh, module to encode uh, my protocol buffer. So here I'm using this, what is PS? PS is my profile service PB2. That's automatically generated code uh, from the .proto file, strongly typed, so I can create, uh, automatically generate that. I'm using my stub. I create a concept of a term using that, um, that helper message module with a season and a year. Uh, year is an, in, uh, is an integer, season is a string. And then I could also create a user, first name, last name. And remember, a user has a term, and we use the proto term for it. Because when, when I'm talking to uh, the user message, it's not expecting ordinary strings. It's now expecting um, to be passed protocol buffers. Notice how I have first name. First name is going to correlate to uh, the string, but the uh, if, I would, if I want to just bear this one more time, remember that a create user profile took a profile. I won't get too much deeper, but essentially, I create a create user profile request here with my user and profile. And I use the stub to execute an RPC, uh, the create user profile RPC, and I pass in that serialized uh, protocol buffer. So I know that was a lot, um, but I do want to show you one neat thing. When I do that, I'm expecting, so my create user profile on the server is going to know how to deserialize this thing. Um, and finally, I'm going to do something with that. So if I go to, and I do a, cool. So I just created a user profile. And I didn't have to do anything besides use my very simple client, give it a couple of parameters, and, it, and the server took care of abstracting away the details from me. And I'm, I'm not going to pull up my, uh, the database that I'm storing this in, but I have a, an entry now, uh, a document that says first name is this, last name is this, uh, and the user profile was something else. I think that's powerful. Let me see if I missed anything. Cool. Protocol buffers, once you get used to the proto file, uh, they're, they're, it's, it's easy to work with. It's very powerful. The, the little bit of effort that you need to put in to kind of learn how to shape things is more than worth the benefit of having strongly typed uh, 
service and message definitions and having uh, machine readable API contracts. So you need to adapt to the style. Getting close to the end, and I appreciate all of your attention, and it's time for you to kind of reflect and consider what this may mean for you on your engineer journey. Machine readable API, API contracts are awesome. It's what all services should do. I shouldn't uh, ambiguously communicate with a server. The server should know what I'm talking about. And when I get a response from a server, I should know exactly uh, the types of messages that are coming back. I should be able to deserialize something small and fast, like a binary protocol, a protocol buffer. I should be able to do that, unless my services doesn't require that level of performance. Implementing, so in this case, we implement our server code once, and that could stay there, and we get many client APIs for free. That, so we get that, uh, that, that PB2 module. We could use that in any client library to serialize our protocol buffer definitions. It comes for free. I hope that screen hasn't been off for too long. Okay. Yes. Okay, uh, that doesn't matter because remember, the slides were just a helper. I'm talking to you. Uh, you're talking about something that is flexible and composable and perhaps most importantly, generic. You don't need to corner yourself into anything. When Python talks about uh, objects that are dynamically typed, Python in the background says, I'm talking about a string. I'm talking about an int32. I'm talking about a bool. So why not put a little bit of legwork in the beginning to have something that is generic and you could have a lot of flexibility and you can tell by now, I hope, that this, is, this sort of setup is ideal for building these small services that have a pointed direction, that do one thing well, which is something that all software must strive to do. If I'm to get up on a soapbox here, I want everyone here to embrace great services. Know that Python is not the only answer out there for building great services. If we build something great, and we want others to use it a lot and have multiple contexts, we shouldn't, they should be able to come and use it without concern. And oftentimes there's a language barrier. So consider if your service could actually be more generic. Flexibility, reusability, and a spirit of gen uh, genericness in your service will help you make something that really wins. Make your life better, make your clients' lives better. Thank you all for your time.